Good evening, everyone, and welcome on behalf of the St. Augustine Center for Ethics, Religion, and Culture at the College of Arbity of the Alms. I'm Dr. Peter DiPergola, Shauna's Family Chair for the Study of the Humanities, Associate Professor of Bioethics and Medical Humanities, and Executive Director of the St. Augustine Center. I have the distinct honor of hosting tonight's Reverend Hugh Crean Distinguished Lecture. And immediately following tonight's lecture, there will be an opportunity to engage directly with our distinguished speaker. For those of us in person, a roving mic will come to you as you raise your hand. And for those joining us live on Zoom, please submit your questions via the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We ask that you please avoid using uh, the chat box to submit questions. It is now my pleasure to introduce Sister Carol Allen. Special Assistant to the President for Mission and Charism, and former and longtime director of the Office of Campus Ministry at Elms College. Sister Carol has graciously agreed to lead us in prayer this evening, so please uh, join me in welcoming Sister Carol. Oh, Divine One. You have created the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth. We are guided by the light of the stars, the moon, and the sun. We are nourished by the fruits of the earth. And we are not separate from your creations. O oh, universal God, we are always responding to your energy. We are enlightened by what is deepest within. We are strengthened by what is curious. We are mended by your healing powers. O oh God of the unknown, we explore the horizons that are out of reach. We respond to the depths of that which is beyond our vision. We meditate on the vastness of it all. We pray, we search, we listen, we believe that you are within, around, under, over, and beside us. Oh, blessed one, bless these moments that prepare us for the work that is to come. Bless these moments that we know for certain who you are. Bless the moments of our journey to deepen our spirituality of recognition. Bless our interconnectedness with all creation, known and unknown. We ask this in the name of the one who creates all. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Carol, for that beautiful <laughs> prayer. It is now my pleasure to introduce the 11th president of the College of Our Lady of the Elms, Dr. Harry Gumay. Prior to joining Elms College, Dr. Gumay served as Senior Vice President for Finance and Chief Financial Officer at St. Anselm College, as Chief Financial Officer and Associate Dean for Finance and Information Technology at the Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard University, and in various leadership positions in finance, in administration at both Boston College and Boston University. President Dumay received a BS degree, magna cum laude, in mechanical technology from Lincoln University, Missouri, a MA degree in public administration from Birmingham State University, a MBA and graduate certificate in corporate finance from Boston University, and a PhD in higher education administration from Boston College. Dr. Dumay has consulted internationally on projects related to higher education and economic development with organizations in Europe and the Caribbean, and serves as a board member for the Council of Independent Colleges. He is a past commissioner and treasurer for the New England Commission on Higher Education, and is a committee member of NECHI's annual report on finance and enrollment. President Dumay also serves as board member, treasurer, and member of the executive committee for the Association of Colleges of Sisters of St. Joseph, 
<clears throat> in addition to several other boards, including Endicott College, the Western Massachusetts Economic Development Council, Pope Francis Preparatory School, Build Health International, Health Equity International, and the Haiti Development Institute at the Boston Foundation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Harry Jume. Good afternoon, everyone. Peter, thank you for this introduction and thank you for your leadership of the St. Augustine Center for Ethics, Religion, and Culture. Since, in, since it, its founding, the center continues to be one of the focal points and visible representations of how Elms College lives up our Catholic mission through teaching, scholarship, and service to the community. And the Reverend Hugh Cream Distinguished Lecture Series which you so ably lead every year, is indeed a shining example of our commitment to mission. It is my great pleasure each year to welcome members of the college community, friends of the college, and members of the Diocese of Springfield to the Reverend Hugh Crean Distinguished Lecture, now in its fourth year. I'm therefore delighted this afternoon to welcome all of you on behalf of students, faculty, staff, and trustees of the college. Before I begin, I need to point out that Bishop William Byrne of the Diocese of Springfield is unable to attend because of a prior commitment. The bishop normally attends, but this year sends his regrets. I wish to thank him for, to thank him for his prior and continued support for the Reverend Hugh Cream Distinguished Lecture and for Elms College overall. Allow me to take a moment to offer my thanks and appreciation to Jack Dill, who is here with us. Um, Jack and Colette Dill, through their generous endowment, allows Elms College to offer the Reverend Hugh Green Distinguished Le Lecture each year. Jack M. Collett created the series as a way to honor the memory of Father Hugh Green and his lasting contributions to both the Springfield Diocese in general and to Elms College in particular. We're grateful for Jack's gift of time this afternoon and for their continued support. Allow me as well to recognize <clears throat> the members of the Board of Trustees who, who are with us this afternoon, either in presence or via Zoom. I also want to recognize all the sisters of St. Joseph who are here tonight, also either in person or virtually. And Though she does not like to be single, that I would like to thank my wife Maggie <laughs> for being here tonight. <laughs> and to everyone else who is here with us, uh, in person or virtually, welcome on behalf of the entire Elms College community. As I mentioned before, the role of the St. Augustine Center for Ethics, Religion, and Culture is to increase engagement in discourse related to ethics religion and culture in today's society and to lead the regional community in thoughtful dialogue. Each year for the Reverend Queen Lecture, a national leader is invited to speak on topics highlighting the richness of the Catholic intellectual tradition. And to that end, we are both delighted and honored to have as our guest this evening, Dr. Karem Over, how did I do? <laughs> Professor of Astronomy and Director of Undergraduate Studies for the Department of Astronomy at Harvard University. Her talk is titled Christian Creation and the Big Bang Cosmology. Throughout his 50 years in the priesthood, Father Hugh Crean was a compassionate and respected pastor, professor, theologian, and advisor. 
He was an extraordinary professor of religious studies at Elms College from 1973 to 1979. Father Hugh Green undoubtedly taught his students that the search for knowledge is at the heart of the Catholic education tradition. The coexistence of faith and reason is at the foundation of Catholic intellectuality. And Father Hugh always encouraged the investigation and evaluation of the most pressing and complex questions of ethics, faith, reason, and current culture. There is no one person on this earth who has all of the answers, but it is a fundamental aspect of knowledge of our faith and of the role of a college or university that we never shy away from asking questions. Thus, it is Elms College's great privilege each year through this lecture series to recognize Father Hugh by learning from leaders and scholars in theology and Catholic thought. Before I hand the microphone back to Dr. Peter de Pergola, Executive Director of the St. Augustine Center for Ethics, Religion, and Culture, I wish to thank him and everyone else at the college who has a part in planning and organizing tonight's presentation, including my executive assistant, Bevan Peters. The success of this program is the direct result of a lot of work and planning by some very dedicated people. My sincere gratitude to all of them. Once again, thank you all for coming and thank you especially Dr. Ober for agreeing to be our guest. I look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Dumay, for those uh, beautiful remarks. And without further ado, it's my great pleasure uh, and privilege to introduce our distinguished speaker tonight, Dr. Karen Oberg. Dr. Oberg is professor of astronomy at Harvard University, where she also serves as director of undergraduate studies, uh, as we heard in the Department of Astronomy. Professor Oberg's academic specialization is astrochemistry. In her research aims to uncover the way in which chemical processes affect the outcome of planet formation, especially the chemical habitability of nascent planets. Dr. Oberg's research team, the Oberg Astrochemistry Group, approaches this question through laboratory experiments, astrochemical theory, and astronomical observations of molecules in planet forming disks around young stars. Professor Oberg's work includes the establishment of the theoretical framework within which exoplanets, uh, exoplanet compositions are interpreted, the discovery and characterization of pathways to complex organic molecules in cryogenic M20K ices, and the recent in-depth observational characterization of the chemistry of planet formation through the ALMA large program maps. Dr. Oberg left Sweden in two, uh, for Caltech in 2001, where she matriculated with the Bachelor of Science in Chemistry in 2005. Four years later, she earned a PhD in astronomy with a focus, uh, a thesis focused on laboratory astrochemistry. In 2009, she moved to Harvard uh, Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics with a Hubble Fellowship focusing on millimeter observations of protoplanetary deaths. She joined the Harvard faculty as assistant professor of astronomy in 2013, was promoted and named the Thomas D. Cabot associate professor in astronomy in 2016, and was promoted to full professor of astronomy with tenure in 2017. Dr. Ober's research in astrochemistry has been recognized with the Sloan Fellowship, a Packard Fellowship, the Newton Lacey Pierce Award from the American Astrochemical Association, a Simons Investigator Award, and the Max Planck Society Harnack Lectureship, a board member of the Society of Catholic Scientists, 
Professor Oberg is a public intellectual in the truest sense. Her extremely popular YouTube videos made in partnership with the Thomistic Institute of the Pontifical Faculty of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C. on the Catholic origins of the Big Bang Theory, the role of faith in the scientific method, the origins of life on Earth, and the possibility of miracles according to science, all of which I non-consensually flooded your email inbox in the last two weeks. It should have given you a small sense of what she brings to our campus uh, this evening. So please join me in extending the warmest possible welcome to Dr. Karen Oberg, who will deliver the 2023 Reverend Hugh Cream Distinguished Lecture titled Christian Creation and the Big Bang Cosmology. Dr. Oberg. Thank you, Peter, for that warm introduction. Thank you, President Demay, for having me here. And of course, thank you to all of you for taking time to, to listening to this. It's my first time out here, and it's such a pleasure to, to be here and to get the chance to share some of my vision of how we can, in a constructive way, think about the truths that we get through the scientific method on the one hand, and the truths revealed uh, through scripture or through tradition uh, on the other. So I'll be talking about a pretty specific topic. It will be about the Big Bang Theory and how we can think about that in light of creation, divine creation, as it's revealed in, in Genesis 1, for example. But I am very open to take questions that are much more broader uh, than that. For example, I will take for granted that what's in the title here is true. That is that the Big Bang Theory is the true description of the very beginning of our universe. And also that the whole universe is the creation uh, of the God that first revealed himself to the Israelites and later stepped into this creation as Jesus of Master. But I, I am happy to take questions and also defend my assent to those truths in addition to the more narrow package that I will be delivering uh, to you today. So it's always good to try to define a bit what you're going to be talking about, since often words and concepts kind of, sort of mean different things, different people. Uh, so when I talk here about uh, Christian creation, uh, what I mean is, in some, is there are two in some quite distinct things at the same time. On the one hand, this, you're going to have to do a little bit of gymnastics. So on the one hand, what I, what I mean is the creation story as, as that's come down to us uh, through Genesis and the Psalm of the Psalms. And I think here is where we can start asking some really concrete questions about the story of creation as revealed in Genesis 1, how that matches up with the story uh, of our universe uh, universe beginning as revealed through the scientific theory of the Big Bang uh, theory of, uh, of the universe. But the other thing that I mean with Christian creation is what's revealed more broadly, both in the Bible and in church uh, tradition, of how uh, the whole universe is the creation of this one God who created as a gift in this very orderly way, uh, first giving us this universe and then giving uh, giving himself to the creatures that he had uh, created. So when we think about creation, we're gonna, we're gonna keep those sort of two concepts side by side. You know, here we sort of comment on the science with these two sort of frameworks in mind uh, throughout the talk. When I'm talking about the big bang cosmology, I also mean two things, which I realize those are naturally kind of a Thomas, like making a list uh, of all things. So you'll hear me have like one, two, and three multiple times throughout the talk. But what I mean when I talk about the Big Bang cosmology is also two things. On the one hand, it is okay. So I will get my step count. Uh, <laughs> you'll get a little bit of a pause uh, between each slide. 
So the one thing, uh, what I mean is how our universe sort of not being clear to existence, but the very earliest time, that's something we're going to have to come back to you, but the very earliest time of our universe's evolution, uh, when it did evolve from something extremely compact and hot into eventually the universe with stars and galaxies and planets that we have today. But the other thing that I mean is the, is the kind of evolutionary cosmos that has been revealed through on the one hand, the Big Bang theory, so that's on the largest scales, but also the origins of planets sort of zooming in a bit, or the origins of life, or how life evolved over time. It seems like whatever scale we're looking at, we're seeing this sort of historical evolving universe. So we're going to, again, those two things are going to be running in parallel. On the one hand, this very specific scientific theory of the Big Bang and the sort of overall structure of the universe that that reveals. But let's begin. Okay. So we now know how many steps, but I do think I need to get closer every time. Um, but on that hand, uh, I am very far away from my 10,000 steps. So <laughs> this is not bad at all. Um, before going into talking about the specifics of the Big Bang here and the Big Bang cosmology, I think it's good to put it in a little bit of perspective that this is not the only cosmology that in some sense Christianity has come up against uh, throughout the ages. And it's best if you also want to try to interpret what Genesis 1 is teaching us of creation, like what kind of cosmology was assumed uh, at the time. If you look at sort of the ancient sort of near, near East. So if you look, if you go back uh, to, let's say, 1,000, 2,000 years BC, the kind of cosmology that was pervasive throughout the Near Middle East is what you can find in some of the Babylonian stories, so things like Gilgamesh or the Numa Elish, uh, where you see it, where you meet the cosmos that is sort of imbued with deity, where the sun, the moon, like different kinds, different cities are all characterized by some sort of God. It is also a cosmos where these gods are in constant battle with one another. And in some sense, nature is quite unpredictable because it is full of these sort of willful creatures that are coming together and in, in different ways. This is, this is the cosmos within which uh, you know, the early books of the Bible in some sense were written down. Uh, when we come to the cosmos that described in Genesis 1, it has some hints all that cosmos, all the surrounding, uh, all, all the surrounding sort of geographical area. In particular, the kind of structure of the cosmos that we find in Genesis 1, we know the dome above, the waters and sort of underwards, where you have a separation between the waters above and the waters sort of below, that is very similar to what you find in New English. So that is not what sets Genesis apart. When we think about what sets Genesis apart, it's sort of biblical cosmology, it is, Things like it is all coming into existence out of nothing by this single single God, rather than by some sort of war or uh, sort of female and male principle coming together, which is what we have in the human age. It's also a very orderly universe where you no longer have these willful deities, but instead you have just things, created things. The sun is like a lamp, the moon is like a lamp, it's no longer a divine thing. So you have a cosmos that has this story unfolding, but also that has law, that sort of loss and that sort of orderliness to it that you don't find in the sort of surrounding cosmologies. By the time that we get to the New Testament kind of writings, there is, has been a development in the kind of cosmology that's assumed by the greater culture, where now in, we have gone through a few hundred years of natural philosophy with the ancient Greeks, Everyone knows that Earth is round. Uh, and the early Christian theologians had to grapple uh, with this. Like, what, what, how do you read Genesis 1 and Augustus? And Augustine, for example, grapples with this. How do you read uh, Genesis 1 and some of the Psalms, which seems to really assume that have a sort of dome, flat Earth, as well, underworld, when everyone knows that the world, that the Earth 
is round. And he he writes about this. And like another thing that he has to grapple with is that the Greek cosmology is sort of eternal in time. It doesn't have a natural beginning or a natural end. That that has to be a beginning and post on it. As we get into the 15 and 16 hundreds, the cosmology changes again, but not as much as you might think, in the sense that the cosmology of the Enlightenment or the scientific revolution, it, so it keeps a lot of things of this sort of ancient Greek cosmology. And it also assumes sort of constants in time. There's not, there's no story uh, to the Enlightenment cosmology. Uh, rather, people think about sort of clockwork kind of universe. You know, maybe God somewhere at some point sort of wound up the clock, and then it just runs exactly that way for uh, forever. This last kind of cosmological model, this sort of clockwork kind of cosmos is not too different to a kind of cosmos that existed about a hundred years ago uh, when astronomers started to peer out uh, onto other galaxies uh, outside of our own. And this is where, again, I take a little walk. <laughs> <laughs> it took the development of really good telescopes for astronomers to realize that our galaxy, the Milky Way, is just one of many. So a galaxy is simply a large collection of stars that are gravitationally bound together. In the case of our galaxy, the Milky Way, around 300 billion stars. Um, and for a long time, astronomers, for good reasons, thought that this was it. This was the universe, our galaxy. But about 100 years ago, astronomers, uh, led by people like Edwin Hubble, like one of the most famous ones, uh, started to realize that there were other galaxies outside of, of ours. And furthermore, they started to see that these galaxies, um, they looked like they were all a little bit redder than they should. And the further away they were, the redder they see. One explanation for why this reddening was happening is that these galaxies are moving away from us. This is completely analogous to when you hear you know, a siren that's moving towards you, you hear a higher pitch, then when it's moving away from you, you hear, hear a lower pitch. Uh, when you look at colors, if something is moving towards you, it looks bluer, when something is moving away from you, it looks redder. Uh, Hubble actually himself was not convinced that this was the explanation, but that's something you can definitely dig into more in q and if you want to know why some of the most famous astronomer that's uh, whose name we think about synonymous with the Big Bang Theory, did not think the Big Bang Theory was true. Uh, he died believing in something much closer to his enlightenment uh, clockwork uh, kind of universe. But he did, he did uh, study these galaxies. He realized that they were better. And then a couple of things started to come together at once in this historical contingency point of view. And that was that around the same time, you know, sort of the brilliant physicist of all time, potentially, Einstein was starting to put together his theories of general relativity. And one of the things that come out of the theories of general relativity is that the universe naturally is unstable. It doesn't want to stay put. It either sort of should be contracting or expanding at any one time. Einstein himself was also a child of the Enlightenment model of the cosmos, where everything is sort of constant in time. So he actually sort of manipulated his equations to get it to stay still, um, not in like a bad way. The equations do allow for this kind of manipulation, um, but he, but it's not sort of natural uh, to them to have a stable, uh, sort of sitting still kind of universe. There was another physicist around the same time, which is pictured here in the middle, uh, the net. He uh, was seeing his PhD in Cambridge at MIT, which is where MIT and Harvard, where a lot of these observations were happening. So we're seeing these astronomical observations of these potentially moving away galaxies. But he was also deep into general relativity, one of the few people at the time that actually understood Einstein's equations. And he started to put two and two together. 
and realized that the most reasonable explanation of what was going on is that the universe was expanding over time. This um, was something that people felt sort of uneasy about, but it became pretty soon it became clear that was really the only reasonable explanation. But then the net took it one step further. And he started thinking, well, if it is expanding, uh, what happens if you go back in time? I mean, it must be smaller and smaller and more and more compact. And if you go back really far, billions of years, then the universe is going to be so dense that it's denser than an atomic nucleus uh, is today. It's like the whole universe is like a single atom, is the way I was thinking about it. Now, this is something that his uh, colleagues didn't at all like, including Einstein and Hubble and many others. Um, it was a very controversial idea because it was starting to look like the universe had a beginning. And this was a time when atheism was already sort of widespread in the academe, and people were very suspicious about people mixing in religion uh, with, with science. And, as you might have guessed from this picture here, Lemaitre was, of course, Father Lemaitre, later Monsignor Lemaitre. He was a priest. Uh, so the fact that the Catholic priest that came forth with this idea, even if he was an accomplished physicist, didn't really help with, uh, with acceptance. But over time, uh, it became clear that his idea was the best explanation of the observations we have. More and more observations also came in. And in the 1960s, uh, this was sort of nailed down that this was the only reasonable explanation when the cosmic microwave radiation was discovered, not showed up a little bit later. But it is an interesting thing that I think when we think about sort of how a religious kind of intuition affects science, we tend to think about it in a negative way. We tend to think about the Galileo affair, for example. But here we have the complete opposite, where it is sort of the atheist enlightenment kind of intuition that's actually standing in the way of a scientific discovery. And I think what it's in terms of showing is the more natural, like the more common way that things have worked historically. There's a reason, I mean, this is a bit of a side note, but there's a reason that we keep coming back to Galileo up there as sort of the big example of conflict between science and religion. If there were a lot of other ones, you would have heard about them. And I mean, the truth is just that there aren't that many others. And this is a much more sort of normal way that a church and science have worked together. But with that historical context, let's talk for you know, a few minutes what the Big Bang theory actually is. So what the Big Bang uh, theory tells us is that almost 14 billion years ago, which on the one hand is really long, but Earth has actually been around for almost 5 billion years ago, so it's not that much longer than something like the solar system. Around 14 billion years ago, the universe was in an extremely compact, energetic hot state, and then started to expand out of that. Within minutes, you start having nuclei of atoms. Um, after about 18 minutes, you stop trying to make new nuclei, and all you had was hydrogen helium, a little bit of lithium. Uh, it took a few hundred thousand years uh, be uh, before you start having light as a matter of having their, uh, their own sort of separate existences. I think I've said enough. After a few hundred thousand years, the universe has expanded and cooled. After a few hundred thousand years, the universe was cooled enough that light could no longer kick out electrons from atoms. Remember, an atom it has a positive nucleus and then there's a cloud of electrons around it. If you have very energetic light, like UV light, for example, you can kick out those electrons. And up until a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, all the light was so energetic that just whenever you form an atom, you immediately destroyed it by this UV light. But a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, the universe had cooled enough that the light was getting sort of cool enough 
but this no longer took place. And at that point, sort of matter and light separated, started having their own existence. And we know this, we know the timing very well because of images like this. This is what the whole sky looks like if you look at very particular wavelengths sort of out towards the radio or in microwaves to be more precise. Um, this radiation that's over the entire sky are those photons that were released from matter just a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. Well, and this was discovered in the 1960s, that was sort of the, the final proof that the Big Bang theory, something like that must really have happened. There's no way to explain this kind of observation uh, otherwise. It took another few hundred million years, uh, actually maybe shorter. That's something that's kind of cool because it's happening right now that the new space telescope and the James Webb is allowing us to peer sort of back into time pretty close to when this happened to see how early on then stars start to form. But we think on orders sort of hundreds of millions of years after this, the universe had cooled down enough that some of the matter could start sort of imploding on itself <laughs> to form the first generation of stars. And once you have stars, you can start having collections of stars that is galaxies. So something similar to our Milky Way. Already with the Hubble Space Telescope, the maybe more famous sort of predecessor of James Webb, uh, we start seeing some of these galaxies very close to uh, two to three hundreds of millions of years when we think they should have formed. And now with James Webb, we're pushing back even further. And we're actually seeing sort of more galaxies and stars earlier on than we would have expected. There were some unfortunate news stories that said that this sort of broke the Big Bang theory. That is untrue. It uh, also is a challenge to the precise description that we currently have of how sort of quickly it cools down that can form stars and galaxies. But the Big Bang theory is still still going strong and is still the best explanation that we have for the universe being the way it is. So within these galaxies, you can then start forming not just stars, but also stars with planetary systems uh, like, like our own. This is uh, another picture from James Webb that's showing what it looks like sort of inside galaxies, where you don't just have stars, but you also have gas and dust that can collapse to form stars. And this here is an interstellar cloud is in the process of turning some of that interstellar matter into stars. And one of the big discoveries of the past sort of two decades is that pretty much whenever a star forms, it forms with a planetary system uh, around it. <coughs> We know this for two reasons. One is that we see planets from other stars to the frequency that we've been doing for a couple of decades. The other is much more recently, we have been starting to look at uh, what happens around young stars. So these are all pictures of material, this of material around young stars. They're so only maybe a million years old or two million years old. And you see these sort of beautiful disks that look like they have sort of carved out kind of lanes in them. And these carved out, these dark lanes, we think they are carved out because there are planets forming in them right now. So what you're seeing right here are new solar systems that sort of coming into existence as we are looking at them. And that's just, I don't know, it's pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, so we know that we know that stars form form with planets. So that's sort of that's the next step as we're going the zoom down sort of ladder within this big bang cosmology. It's that we develop these solar systems uh, over time. We even know somehow uh, some of how the material in these disks is turned into planets. So we, we know that we start out with gas and dust. This dust can coagulate to form boulders. These boulders can basically collide to form planets. 
Committees may mention this is that someone like Newton, who was definitely a big believer in sort of the laws of nature and the power of the laws of nature, one of the things he thought could not be done by the laws of nature are things like forming planets and planetary systems. He actually thought that was something that gods would have to step in and do, uh, do directly. And one of the big discoveries in sort of the past hundred years or so is just how powerful the sort of the laws of nature, laws of physics are uh, to develop the kind of universe that we see see in us. I just didn't want to run back and forth since those were things I had basically been talking about, which is that there are there are many planets from other stars. On at least one of these planets that have been forming, uh, that is our own planet, something very special happened, which is that we had this planet that had water uh, on it. It had organic molecules. We know what those come from. Water is the most common molecule, or one of the most common molecules in the universe. And we know that organic chemistry is very plentiful where plants are forming. Uh, so that's not the mystery of why you get the planet that has the right conditions to have something like a biosphere. But what is special is that this is at least one planet ended up actually turning chemistry into biology. Let me see if I can actually just. I'm getting a little tired of this. The highlights are just moving over here. I'm going to try to keep this at a sort of a reasonable distance. Um, so at some point around four billion years ago, something like that, chemistry here on Earth turned into biology. This is an amazing thing. We don't understand how this happened yet. That doesn't mean you need to invoke a miracle. I mean, that's something we can definitely talk about. I am pretty convinced we're going to find a natural explanation to the origins of life. And uh, I said, happy to take questions about it, but I do not think this is a threat at all to when we're thinking about divine creation, which is how it's sometimes sort of marketed as, as you're sort of removing things for God to do by having a natural origins of life. I mean, it's... I just think it's so much more impressive to create a universe where chemistry can turn itself into biology than in something stepping in like a magician and is spurting out life uh, out, of, out of molecules. But we know this happened. And we know that over time, we developed this uh, genetic code within which all life here on Earth is sort of encoded, like all, all the way that life functions can in one way or another be traced back to the DNA and, and RNA. Uh, I mean, one of the things that amazes me, and here I'm speaking as a, as a lay person rather than as an expert, is how at the heart of all living things is something like a language. That doesn't mean it's miraculous, but I do think it's one of those many imprints that we see of the creator and that as uh, a believing Christian, I mean, in some sense, maybe I shouldn't be too surprising uh, that the logos is also present at sort of the very heart of all of all life. Life quickly developed to be something very complicated. Within a few hundred million years, we start having cells that are not too different from the cells that we have today, where uh, crazy things are going on. And this, like if you go to YouTube and you look for the inner life of the cell, you can see this actual animation. Um, but where you have these little guys, this is a motor protein, carrying these vesicles from one side of the cell to another. And that is going on in your body all the time. And also in all other life uh, here, uh, here on Earth. So you have to say that life is very complicated. Now, of course, this life evolved over time. And eventually, you got something, like some very intelligent animals, um, our sort of biological forefathers. And around 50,000 years ago or so, a small portion of these very intelligent animals started to do something that no intelligent animal can do. 
And that is develop a language, develop abstract thinking, and develop art. And if you want to think about what it means as a human to be both created out sort of the dust of the earth and having a rational soul inspired like into us, but I think one of sort of the beautiful demonstration of what that looks like is in these early uh, cave paintings. Um, this is something that goes far beyond intelligence, which is present in several animals and requires a kind of sort of supernatural immaterial soul that all human life possesses. So that I think is a quick sort of walkthrough of what I mean with a big bang cosmology. So what I want to do next is to just address a few proposed conflicts between this cosmology and the Christian creation, which was the second part of the, of the thesis. And the reason, I mean, I'm not going to go through so the Christian creation story, the way that I walked through the Big Bang cosmology, kind of assuming uh, that you have sort of these outlines of that. But of course, feel free to ask questions uh, if there's something that doesn't make, make sense. So the first sort of conflict that often comes up, our proposed conflict, is that when you read Genesis, it just sounds like a very different description of creation compared to something like the Big Bang uh, theory. You know, there's no separation of light and matter described in Genesis. And also things seem to happen over a very short time span compared to what we know in the Big Bang cosmology. And it seems to be happening on a very small sort of spatial scales compared to Big Bang cosmology. And it's just like many things that they just seem so different. So surely there must be a conflict. I think the first thing to recognize is that sort of pure literalistic kind of historical reading of Genesis 1 is kind of forbidden by Genesis 1 itself. You don't even have to go into sort of church tradition or take the science class to know that this cannot be a historical account. One of the examples, I mean, part of it is that you should, like the poetic structure of Genesis 1 should give some clues that this was not meant to be sort of a science textbook. But even things like the fact that you have sort of day and uh, night before you have the sun and the moon. We often think about the ancients as not just being not very scientific, but not very smart. And that is a mistake. Um, they might not have known how stars and planets form, as I sort of briefly outlined, but they for sure knew that the rising of the sun is the same as a day. Uh, this is not something that you need to be a scientist to, to connect those two concepts. So one of the things that the human author is doing with Genesis it's pretty clear demonstrating that you know, when he talks about the day and when he talks about uh, sort of order of creation, that that is not the historical account when you look at where he places the origin of the sun and where he creates the places the sort of first day and the first night. So if it's not supposed to be sort of this literalistic historical narrative, what is it supposed to be? Well, this is where it's good to step, you know, to remind ourselves so we talked about the kind of surrounding cosmology of things like the Numa Elish, within which this uh, new worldview and new theology was sort of proposed. Things that it's saying is that the universe had the beginning. That is very clear. It also what's clear is that it is a universe that develops over time. You have these days, this sequence of sort of first this big creation and then this sequence of developments. One of the things the medievals notice is that this sequence doesn't so much seem to be a time sequence as one that's first of separations. So you think about the first few days, you separate life and matter, you separate the water above, the water below, and so on. And then you have three days of adornment. You put in the birds, you put in the, the things being on land, you put in the humans. And this seems to be a much, so it's just taking care of this much more seriously to take all these clues into account than to take it this sort of like historical sort of scientific approach. In some way that is like actually not very respectful to the way that Genesis uh, is written. So we have those things, but if you're listening to things I said, in the back of your head, there should already be, well, that doesn't sound that different from the Big Bang cosmology. The Big Bang cosmology says there was a beginning. 
there's these separations or this adornment of uh, the new stars and planets of the, then the animals and the eventually humans. Uh, it's also not that different in that it is this very orderly universe where laws of nature is what's governing uh, how things are moving rather than some sort of willful deity. So we have this sort of both historical and law-abiding universe, which is what is different about Genesis 1 compared to the surrounding sort of ideas of the universe. What's not different is sort of this direct dome-like structure and things like that. Those are just taken from the, from the surrounding cultures. As you start, so the overall structure I would say it's very compatible. And that's probably why when the Big Bang Theory was introduced, it was very controversial among many scientists. But guess who loved it? The Catholic Church, especially the Pope that was contemporary with Lamed. And he loved it because it was this scientific, it seemed like it was the scientific evidence that in some sense the intuition and the truths revealed by scripture were right in terms of the historical sort of na nature of the universe. If you start looking at some details in Genesis, I think there are some intriguing parallels, but here we are really now talking more about things that may or may not be spiritually fruitful and not things that I would sort of tie my theology to. But I can't help to find that the separation of life and matter, uh, that that just brings like such a beautiful icon of, the, of the, what Genesis talks about, the separation of life and darkness. And also we talk about our origin as this strange creature that's it's an expanding this pattern of the natural and the supernatural, like how, how evolution on the one hand has shaped our bodies, but then if we need an explanation from immaterial souls, that just is such a beautiful parallel to how Genesis describes it as our bodies being sort of shaped out of the dust of the earth and therefore making us true tins of all living things. We are deeply connected to all living things. And yet we are something else also. We also have sort of one foot in the material world and one foot uh, in the immaterial one. But as I said, that is more, is it useful for you? Take it. If it's not, then move on uh, to, the, to the Psalms, which is the place where we can always sort of rest. Because I, I think another place where uh, where people look for conflicts between the Big Bang cosmology on the one hand and uh, the sort of biblical creation on the other is in terms of the scales and our place uh, in the universe. It is the Big Bang cosmology just seems so big and so old, old, ancient. There's nothing human scale about it. Like, how can we connect that with the much more sort of human scale view of creation that's given in, in Genesis. I mean, there's a couple of things I would say to that. First of all, us thinking that in terms of the universe is too big to be made for us, or like it, it doesn't seem out of proportion. Now we're really making God human light when we say things like that. If we, if we take the sort of classical understanding of God as being completely outside of his creation, being infinite in power, it is not harder for him to make a big universe than to make a small one. So complaining that he made one that was sort of too big for us is a little bit strange. I mean, he, the mm -hmm. other thing I would say is that there have always been things that have been too big for us. And that's why I want to like, sort of bring back, you know, this bring up the psalmist who says, like, even as you know, an ancient, when he looked up on this heavens, on the skies, the moons and the stars, that also made him wonder, you made this enormous universe. That what is man that you are mindful of him, a son of man that you care for him? This is not a new problem. This was a problem for the ancients as well. But the psalmist, just a line later, also recognized that it might be a mystery, but it doesn't make it less true that yet you have made him little less than a god, crowned him with glory and honor. And I, the, the larger we find out that the universe is, the more amazing this line is. 
um, whenever I feel like a little bit complacent about my faith, uh, thinking about the Big Bang Theory and at the same time uh, picturing uh, God as a baby is a pretty good way to bring you back the awesomeness uh, of the this universe that we inhabit. The final thing I would say on this is that I think there's a sense of sort of historical development that has have pushed up, pushed us from the center of the universe to sort of the outskirts, to like the unimportant sort of suburbs of the universe. Um, which uh, as I will show is actually not a perfectly correct historical analysis. Uh, but if we take Aristotelian. Uh, which was the medieval cosmology. The Earth was at the center and all the planets and everything further out. First thing to recognize is that the center was the worst. This is where you have the corrupt, so like kind of gross things going on. And then the further we get, the closer to God in the heavens you get. So it's not exactly a place of honor to be at the center of the universe. But over time, of course, we moved out from the center to being one of many planets around the sun. Then our sun is one of many stars in the galaxy, our galaxy is one of many galaxies, and, and so on. So there, there seems to be a story where we are sort of losing importance for each sort of century of scientific discovery. But there's the opposite story, which tells us that. Um, which tells us that this whole amazing universe and sort of the size of it is something all the more in some sense amazing and beautiful for us not meeting it, us being so small at its center. And that one of the reasons that God made the universe so big isn't a way to show forth his glory to us. This whole universe might be a gift to us. Now, I'm actually hoping there is other life out there, but we don't know that. It is, might very well be that this whole universe was made just for us. Or more precisely, it was made uh, not, it was um, made for a single man that came into this creation. When we're thinking about what is sort of the point of creation, God stepping into it to definitely be out there, and he stepped into it right here. So if you want to talk about possibility of multiple incarnations and other planets, I'm also very happy <laughs> to talk about that and try to stray away from heresy as much as I can. <laughs> um, so, so, so where I want to end, though, is a couple of ways in which I think that the Big Bang cosmology is, is not only not in conflict uh, with the, the idea of creation that we get through Christianity, there's actually something that can be helpful. I think it is, um, when we think about sort of the full, like just how big the universe seems and is, I think it is extremely providential that we have received this wondrous icon of what infinity or even eternity is like. I think we often, I mean, one of the things sort of complaints that we often sort of here against certain tenets like in religion is that they don't make sense, that you can't picture them, that they're incomprehensible. The fact, but the universe is like incomprehensible. And that should give us some idea that if we believe that there is someone who made the universe, of course we're not fully going to understand him. Of course we're going to sort of fumble in words when we try to describe him. And we are, we are very fortunate in that he, just, he decided to give us some language for us to use. But beyond that, we are going, we are going to be somewhat in, in the dark. And one of the ways that we get better pictures, images, is through science. But the, the main point that I want to get to, which I already sort of hinted at, um, is that there is no, from a scientific point of view, there's no center of the universe. They're all sort of equally unimportant. But if there is only one incarnation, there is one center, and that is Bethlehem and Jerusalem. And the fact that we get to be close to that is one of those ridiculous sort of privileges and, and gifts. 
But I want to say, I want to move on to sort of a few thoughts about how we can think about the Big Bang in a sort of constructive way, uh, sort of enriching sort of Christian faith and Christian theology. But the final distinction that I want to make before going there is how to think about the Big Bang versus creation. We often talk about the Big Bang as being the beginning of the universe, but this is not technically true. So we don't, we cannot scientifically see the beginning of the universe because that beginning would be outside of the universe. It would be outside of space and time. Now, when we talk about creation, we talk about creation out of nothing, so ex nihilo. And that is not what the Big Bang is. The Big Bang is talking about the evolution of something already in existence. There might have been something before the Big Bang. We don't know. Uh, in some sense, we're not in too different of a place compared to medievals who were speculating whether it was possible to prove whether the universe had a beginning or not. And Thomas Aquinas famously said you couldn't, that that was sort of an act of faith that it had a beginning. And we are still there. Um, that being said, like just because they're not the same thing doesn't mean that it's so inconsequential that we now know that the universe had like something very close to a beginning. Um, if you wanted an icon of creation, like somebody could, we could actually sort of comprehend. I mean, the Big Bang is a pretty, pretty darn good icon. I mean, much better, I think, than any theologians ever came up with. Uh, now science has actually, uh, actually revealed. And it's, I think it's quite providential that this happened right as a sort of atheist that was taken over the academe. We got this sort of strange confirmation that the universe having sort of a story uh, seemed to ring true and having a beginning. Because that is what the Big Bang sort of cosmology is telling us. The universe is historical. It has a beginning. It has a middle, which we are living in. And even naturally, it has an end, whether that's the same end as that they re revealed through scripture, as they found unclear, probably they are quite different. But the idea that there is a story that we can pick up that through science, I mean, I find to be a really helpful thing. Another way that the scientific method and sort of the big time cosmology has revealed something about God and something about our faith is just how powerful things, created things are in causing other things to happen. So the power of secondary causality. So things that don't have sort of causal power in their own, they have to get them from someone else and ultimately from God, but they still have real causal powers. Dust rains do cause planets to form. Chemistry does cause biology to come into existence. This is a creation that has an incredible dignity in it that gets to be part of its own sort of self-fulfillment. When I think about this as somewhat analogous to us being endowed by free will and we get to sort of determine in some sense our own uh, future, in some sense the whole universe gets to do that too. Doesn't mean it's a competition with providence, and that could be another thing we could discuss, uh, but it is like this really beautiful dignity that all creation is imbued with. And another way in which the Big Bang, and maybe in some of the most providential of all that the Big Bang theory brings to us, is a sense of contingency, not just of us, but of the whole universe. You can demonstrate philosophically that whether a universe is eternal or not, it needs to have some causal origin. It needs to have a creator. But I think this becomes much easier to ignore if you have a universe that are constant in time, so naturally eternal. If you have a universe with a beginning, it is very hard, it should be very hard to not ask, well, what came before? Like, why is it there? And ultimately, who put it there? And again, that this happened around 100 years ago, as we're seeing um, some of this religion being practiced less and less, I, I see a sort of a divine wake-up call uh, showing up right when we need it at the most. But where I want to end 
is with two two images that come down to us from the James Webb telescope. I uh, like this one, one from Hubble and one from James Webb, which is just showing how beautiful the uh, universe is. It didn't have to be this beautiful, nor as beautiful as this, but it's all showing stars that we come into existence. And it's one of these wonderful things that I think no matter where we're coming from, no matter our faith, like seeing pictures like this just fills us with awe and gratitude. And one of the things that I am is very grateful for is that I know who to thank. And that I think is one of those things that is a constant reminder uh, of, of why I believe in the first place. But whether or not that is what's sort of tugging on your heartstrings, the fact that we are in this sort of beautiful universe where you want to say thank you to someone, I think is another thing that should get you thinking and, and pondering what kind of universe we live in. And with that, thank you for your attention. Happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Over, for that uh, moving and enlightening and beautiful um, lecture. Uh, we now have the opportunity to engage directly with uh, our distinguished speaker. And for those of us in person, I'll try to, um, we actually have a, a task ahead of us. Uh, for those in person, instead of the roving mic so that uh, Dr. Over does have a place to come, if you uh, could, Shout your question to Dr. Ober. You can repeat the question. Um, for those on Zoom, uh, please feel free to submit your questions for Dr. Ober via the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And we do remind you to avoid using uh, the chat box to submit questions. It's now my pleasure to introduce our Q&A moderator for this evening, Dr. Michael McGravy, Assistant Professor of Religious Studies and Director of the Institute uh, for Theology and Pastoral Studies. So my token is over to you. There's no sound yet. That is all we have. Okay. Questions from the audience. Right. I'm bad at still, so I'm just gonna grab this one again. Please. Yeah. So just uh, this great book called uh, the penultimate curiosity, which I think you touched on, pointed out that for most of human history. Uh, scientific explanation, natural thought, and religion were not separate. I wonder if you could comment on uh, what, what caused those two ideas, or those two pursuits to pursue different paths. Yeah, no, it's, it's a very interesting question because even if you look at the early sort of scientific uh, time, uh, they are not fully separate. I mean, someone like Newton writes more on theology. I mean, it's a strange theology, but theology nonetheless, that he does about physics. And he repeatedly uses some of his gods sometimes as explanations when he doesn't think there is a physics sort of explanation. So, so this is not something that's just going back to Asians. This continues at least in sort of the 17th and, and 18th century that scientists cite God as their inspiration and the fact that God has created sort of the laws of nature, that they therefore there's their duty to go and find those. Laws of nature. So, I, so it is a very, it is a very recent thing. And I, I think there's a couple of things I could speculate about. And they have here, you know, I'm not an historian. These are the pure, uh, take this for what they were. One of them is the success of, um, is a very limited sense of causality that develops in the early scientific times. So if you go back to the Greeks or the Middle Ages, there's this pretty sort of rich sense of how causes work in nature. That's not just the sort of build your ball kind of causality, but also where you're heading towards in some sense is causing you to head towards that. This I think is the easiest to see in biology, where some of the acorn is growing to grow into an oak, for example. But the early science, sort of scientific revolution was a very physics oriented one. And they developed sort of a sense of causality being that basically all billion balls. Uh, so where things sort of hitting one another and that's what's causing everything. 
And if that's the only kind of cause you have, then God as a cause, it's difficult to think about how God is a cause in that kind of reality. And it's it's like his group gets pushed to the sidelines more and more as they're trying to convince themselves that the only thing, that the only way you need to explain the word is to this like Billy Ball kind of causality. So I think that's one thing that is happening. I think another thing that is happening is that we also get at least in parts of the Western works of an impoverished theology. Um, I mean, I grew up in a Protestant country. I was an Anglican for many years. I have a lot of affection uh, for uh, those churches. But I, I think there is something that's lost in the Reformation as you can abandon some of the traditions of the church. This sort of very rich um, understanding of how to interpret the Bible using uh, using these and sort of observations of the word, which is very common with the church fathers and the medievals, for example. So it's sort of like at the same time you get some impoverished theology of nature, and you also get some impoverished sense of what how causes work, and therefore how two causes can act at their very different levels at the same time. I think an example that I've stolen from someone else, I don't remember who, so sorry, whoever I told this wrong. Uh, but it's a good one, is that the way we can think about how God and something in the universe can cause at the same time is that if I'm writing uh, sort of poetry on the blackboard, for example, or writing poetry with a pen, every word that is written on that piece of paper is coming from me. But every word that I'm writing on a piece of paper is also coming from the pen. We're just like two very different kind of causes that are acting at the same time, when both of us are responsible for what ends up on that piece of paper. And that disappears uh, with the there's enlightenment kind of kind of sense. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, so thank you first for your presentation. It was a joy to listen to it. My question has a bit of a theological undertone to it. So in the book of Genesis in chapter one, you have the waters being divided, one above the firmament, the other below, the one below making the seas. What is the one above the firmament in your perspective? Okay, so I forgot to, uh, to repeat the previous question, so I'll try to do a better job on this one. Uh, so the question is that when we're looking at the cosmology in Genesis, we have a separation of water, one from the sort of separation is separated by a half dome. So you have the water above the dome, you have the water so that's in the world of the humans. And it's very understandable for us what are the water of humans, that's in the sea slates and so on. Um, so there are two ways you could go down answer this question. One is from some historical contingency point of view. This is very close to what's described in the new age, which is older than than the cosmology described in Genesis, where you have originally two watery principles that are sort of mating, and that is what sort of origins of the universe. So in some sense, water is primordial. And it is this that are part of what you're doing as in, in my English uh, is that you are sort of separating different kinds of watery principles. And it's a pretty gross thing where the dome of the earth is created in a carcass of a monster god and things like that. So, so structurally similar to Genesis, but very different kind of undertones. So you can trace it back historically to the kind of cosmos that, that you have in certain language. You can also think about it just from a natural point of view that we do see the rain coming down. And when you have the story of Noah, it's basically you're opening the floodgates from this sort of water too much. But there's something sort of natural intuition about this that you do have this water above this coming down at a strain and so on. And then if you want to go really poetic about it and bring in astronomy, then I would tell you that the water here on Earth um, is older than the Earth itself. It came from space, it came from the interstellar cloud that this our sun and the planet is formed from. So the sort of water from above. There is like some beautiful analogy there with how actually the earth came together with the water, some sense, some of it being left in space and some of it in the atmosphere. So those are three answers to your reasonable question. Okay. I, I 
have a question regarding, oh, yes, and also thank you so much. This is incredibly interesting. Um, I'm always interested in like medical bioethics and I just find it fascinating. Um, but what is your view on looking at the like the timeline of the, the world developing? What is your view on how long the world has been here? Because I know there's some controversy between it being billions of years old versus thousands of years old with doing um with dealing with like religion and then the scientific community. And what is your um view on like the dinosaurs? Because I know that that's just gonna hang something. <laughs> Okay, so thank you for that question. So it's repeated, but a shortened form of it. So on the one hand, the question is about the age of the Earth and how we should think about uh, sort of the sometimes biblical dating that's done when we get to sort of five, six, seven thousand years uh, compared to the Big Bang cosmology that I just described, which puts us the Earth at sort of Work with seven billion years of the universe as a whole at almost 14 billion. So it's actually be very different. And the other, I think, that has to do with dinosaurs, which I think which is could be controversial in two ways. One is the time argument that they seem to be much older uh, than sort of 7,000 years. And the other one is evolution. I mean, I think that covers the different controversies. Okay, let me quickly get to it. Number one. The Earth is 4.6 billion years old. Yeah. <laughs> this might sound like harsh, but it's true. Uh, and uh, we have this is like a lot of different kinds of evidence that are coming together to show that that is the case: geological, astronomical, chemical, biological. The pattern. This, this is this is one of those things that's just not going going to change. So the question, I think, the more the question is that I just I find interesting. How is the Bible wrong? Does it mean that there's like we need to question sort of the biblical story? And I would say no. I mean, the, if we look at where this creation is described in, in the Bible, it's mainly in Genesis, you get sort of allusion to allusions to throughout, but it's mainly, mainly in Genesis 1. We have already in some sense established that the day cannot be a day in Genesis 1. So we don't have but if you move away from that sort of like date concepts in Genesis 1, you lose that sense of sort of time or sort of deep time in Genesis already. I mean, I would go one step further and say that although it comes to the age of humanity, like us and sort of immaterial soul, rational, immaterial soul holder, rational animal, we can also date that back further from sort of 40 or 50,000. Uh, years, so that's at least sort of similar time. Um, so, so I think if this is one of these times where it's like this sort of like unnecessary conflict is being brought up, but it's sort of like over interpretation was in the Bible, while we have this pretty sort of clear data from, from another kind of kind of science. Um, and when it comes in, that in some sense, it shares the dinosaurs as well, because now there is time for the dinosaurs have existed. Um, and I think the controversy when it comes to evolution has sort of two sources. One, which I don't want to dismiss that right, but there's always like good reasons for people having it, but one that I think is not that deep, which is simply this sort of like time argument. But then I think there's one that is much deeper, which I have some sense of much more sympathy with, which is the desire to keep human dignity. That I think there is an idea that if we are just an animal, there's nothing that safeguards human dignity. And we know that there's this very frail, like we just, this is something that needs safeguarding. It's not something we can take for granted. And this thing, if you look at many of the early debates on evolution, this is where it's coming from. It's coming from people's deep intuition that we have to make sure that we safeguard certain human dignity. And I think the thing that I would say to that is that you can do both. You can have our body be formed through sort of evolutionary processes, which ties us to the animals and makes, you know, the makes the whole creation or so our sisters and brothers in some deep way. But at the same time, say that we are set apart, that we are the only creature that have a rational soul, that do stand with material and immaterial 
uh, words. And that that is where dignity comes from. It is from having a being made in the image and likeness of God and having in a material soul being directly spirited uh, into us. There's really only two things that we know for sure that God creates, uh, God creates out of nothing. One is the whole universe, and one is every single baby. I mean, and that's when the, our material soul is created out of nothing uh, for us. And I think that is where, that is our safeguard and our dignity um, more than anything else. So thank you for that question. I think that is really important. I, I'm interested in your uh, work in chemistry. What kind of resolution of chemicals are you seeing uh, on these protoplanets that you're studying? Yeah, uh, thank you for the slightly more technical question. Um, so I'm going to try to give this on scale that makes sense. So our whole solar system is about, that's nice, it's about 100 times bigger than the distance from the Earth to the sun, 100 astronomical units. So that's about the size of many of these disks. So that's the overall, overall size. Then our resolution, so our spatial resolution, is on the order of between um, I think 10 astronomical units. So we could separate what's going on where planets like the Earth is forming compared to what's going on where planets like Jupiter is forming. So that's the spatial, that's sort of the purely spatial sense. Uh, that might sound super impressive, but we are looking at things that are hundreds of light years away. So the kind of resolution that we have is an order of 0.1 arc second. Now, what that means, so every you have 360 degrees in a circle. We can divide up every degree into 60 arc minutes, and then every arc minute into 60 arc seconds. And then we are looking at even smaller sort of scales on the sky than that. Now, what's super cool also is that we have another axis, which is that of wavelength or color. And there we have super high resolution, so we can really tell which molecule we're looking at or where. So you can tell the difference between some alcohol and some organic acid and so on, and where they are sitting. Sorry, I didn't complete the question, but hopefully for the answer, it was obvious that it was about this. <laughs> Do you have any observations about the projected future of our human existence beyond our material lives as we know it? Okay, okay so the question is on um, the future of human existence. So when you're talking beyond material, then we're talking beyond science, right? So the scientific project deals with the material order of the universe, the laws of governance, and so on. So, so I'm going to, it's not that I'm first going to give you an answer that's not an answer to your question, which is that the, all, the future of the universe as a whole, um, if we look at the laws of physics, is a universe that's just expanding and expanding and expanding, getting darker and darker and darker. So, pretty depressing. If we're zooming in on our Earth, we have about another billion years of being in this nice, temperate climate. After that, the Earth, the sun is going to get bigger and scorched. Uh, they are so also pretty depressing. But the good news is that the, the timelines are pretty long. We're talking books. So that's what science can tell us. Now, when you're talking about human future that goes beyond the material, now we're entering the realms of theology, maybe philosophy, but maybe theology. And there we are told some of those two things very clearly, I think all Christians agree on. One is that one day Jesus will come back. And that's going to be some very sort of definitive event in history that sort of ends existence as we, as we know it. The other thing that we're told is that it's going to have, it's going to come like a thief in the night. So we're not going to be able to know when that happens. So that in some sense is my very non, non answer to your question mm. that we have some scientific projection of sort of very large material scales. But when it comes to material, their science is fine. So, um, musing about the saving the dignity of, of human, then veering a little bit away from cosmology and astronomy to um, 
data science. It, are you, uh, you know, how do you think about artificial intelligence and the evolution of that with the saving of the dignity of humans? Thank you for that question. So your question was about artificial intelligence and how to think about that in light of this human dignity that I were just uh, talking about. I don't have any good answers, but I guess I'll sketch a couple of our brief thoughts. One is that when we are doing artificial intelligence, we are creating in the likeness of image of us. That is always going to be more limited than a creation in the likeness of image of God. So we should expect that we can get AI to do a lot of things, a lot of good things, a lot of bad things, because we are fallen creatures. So when we create something in the image and likeness of us, we should expect that it's a mixture of both, that we are fundamentally good and we're very fallen. Um, but we should also expect that there are many things that we cannot do. And what I expect we'll see that the most is in sort of the creativity. I mean, right now, AI, is extremely good at sort of combining sort of pre-existing things in, in new ways. But what's so special about humanity is that we have been given this sort of role in some sense as sub, I think Tolkien says sub-creator instead of co-creator, because it is a very different level compared to God, uh, um, where we can really see and come up with new things and we can do art and poetry that's novel, not just sort of talk as what's already existed. And I do not think we will, that that's something that AI will ever do, that we'll be able, that we'll be able, and sometimes we can think about it as the difference between creating a really good robot and creating a new child. One thing I think will get so much further than we are today, and the other thing requires creatia ex nihilo from God. Wondering what your experience has been as a believer in the scientific community, you know, particularly at Harvard. You, you, you have your technical, physical work, and then you have your what maybe I would call belief work that you brought to us tonight. It's just wondering if you could talk a little bit about your experience and how that belief work is uh, perceived or accepted. Just to summarize the question, which is sort of more about my personal experience about uh, sort of woman of faith in a very secular university and in a sort of secular intellectual environment. Um, it's been good, it's a very short answer. So I have a convert, and uh, like many converts, um, I am eager to convert others. Mm -hmm. And once you have got to experience that journey yourself, it is for sure something you hope that people you love will also get to experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just to say that that's it. I have been very open about being Catholic from, from before I was sort of negotiating with Harvard. So one of the things that really helped me, I mean, I'm not sure if this is like prudent or something I would generally recommend, but one of the things I knew coming in there is that they knew that this was something that was important to me. So there was like no sort of hiding of that or something that needs to be sort of come out with at a later point. It was there from the from the beginning. And that certainly was really helpful. But then I mean I think even if I hadn't done that, I mean my experience has been that the sort of range of attitudes that people have goes from weird hobby, don't care, to curious, to how we talk about it, like if I really like you know, I've been thinking about sort of this faith thing or Christianity thing that wouldn't be willing to talk about it. And I'd say the majority is probably in, you don't bother me, so I don't care, kind of can. But I've had a lot of really beautiful experiences with your healthy people at different stages uh, of, of their journey. And my colleagues, regardless of what they think where they fall in the spectrum, have all been really supportive and me spending time on this. But they they have received it as something that's enriching the environment for those students of faith that we have coming to Harvard and a way to show that that you don't have to choose uh, between sort of being faithful um, almost regardless of which religion it is. So I have also a few students you know, that are Christian, Jewish, and Muslim. Uh, but, but it doesn't 
like you don't have to choose between that and a scientific project. You can be a great scientist and also be someone who stays faithful. And uh, so they, as far as I can tell, they're mostly seeing this as uh, something that's good for your partner. Um, you know, no idea what's what's coming in the future, but um, but it has been so much better and more beautiful than I thought it was going to be uh, arriving um, mm -hmm. at our. Can I, can I offer a comment and then a question? Okay. Uh, um, I'm oh, sure. So, a, a fellow theologian actually sent me this picture, um, which I believe is from the James Webb, correct? Uh, and he shared a story that they pointed a microphone at this, correct? And, and they were able to find, okay. They were able to find um, sounds attached to uh, the sky, right? This image. Um, and it, it, the thing that's running through my head is the thought, and maybe this is a future paper, I don't know, but um, the idea that the angelic chorus and the, the sort of the instruments of the angelic chorus playing tied to your research in uh, astronomy, or astrology, excuse me. No, astronomy. You're good first time. All right, so that, that was my comment. And my question is, um, your, your talk was very anthropocentric. Uh, and, you know, the, the curious sci-fi fan in me wants to know your thoughts about the non-anthropocentric, the non-human-centered view of uh, sort of creation, what that might look like, how we might uh, face that should we encounter extraterrestrial or extra-dimensional creature, whatever it might be. So I am going to put myself to challenge some of the that's the underlying like sort of themes of that question. So bear with me. There's gonna be an answer as well, maybe. Um, so so on the first one. So I guess the way I mean it's a beautiful sort of image that you're painting. So that I don't want to challenge. I guess I just want to sort of clarify a little bit what I think maybe it, it was referring to what what you read about. So we study these clouds of all kinds of wavelengths including the wavelengths that go into you know, the radio, the microwave, uh, things that we hear on Earth would um, more think about tools as transmitting sound. Uh, and you do get patterns back that you could, in some sense, translate into sound. This is actually one way that there's a people in my field that work beautifully with the visually impaired in ways to translate uh, what we observe into, into sound. Um, but I guess I don't want to take away that there is someone emitting sound there that we can pick up because that that sound doesn't travel very well in space, uh, which is why in a good sci-fi movie things are very quiet. Um, but the kind of radio waves that we can see pattern and translate into sounds, there's another way to experience this very beautiful reality that allows us to use some more. So that's just my I guess nitpicky clarification. But to your more to your question, which is very interesting. Okay, so my challenge is that there's no way I cannot be human-centric mm -hmm. because I'm a human. So even if you ask me to talk about non-human life, I'm going to do it from a human perspective. Um, but I am going to talk about non-human life because I think that's a very interesting, interesting question. If um if the organs of life here on Earth was a natural process, which I think it was, even though we haven't figured out how it happened, then if you have the same conditions on the young Earth and other planets, you might expect them to also develop like them. There's no reason they should be sort of just, just here. It is sort of, there's something in chemistry that is, it is, it would be controversial to use the word director towards life in the sciences. But it's actually what kind of scientists think, even though they would never use those words, that somehow chemistry naturally develops into biology. You could not do that if chemistry was random. Like there's this, that there, you know, the monkey is trying typing out Shakespeare kind of problems. There are just too many different ways to combine atoms. You have to have that they somehow build into the laws of chemistry that you build up the complexity 
that can eventually take the form of a living thing. But let's say if it's straight, which I think it is. Um, and also what we know from astronomy is that there are many, many other planets out there that seem quite similar to Earth. It seems to me it's quite, um, quite, quite likely that we get the coordinates of life, we get life in other planets. So I think, I think that is very likely. I'm hoping to still be alive when we find it, but I will see how long, how long that takes. And I think that's theologically not very controversial. If you just say human centric or not, that, that doesn't really matter. If we find more the bacteria, that's not, I think, going to upset anyone's theology very much. So I think the real question where it gets interesting is if we find other things like ourselves. And that's what I mean. I can't, like, first of all, I can't be not human centric, but I'm not even sure I want to. Because what I think that we are really looking for are rational animals. Mm -hmm. Right, that, that when we talk about intelligent aliens, what we mean are creatures that have an animal body and have the ability to do things like language and technology. Right, that that is, and that is sort of that is the, some defining characteristics of a rational animal like ourselves that have an immaterial soul. So, if these intelligent aliens exist out there, they too were created out of nothing. Mm -hmm. And that could be, I think, somewhat reassuring, but they're not going to be there accidentally. If they are there, it's because of, uh, if you're a person of faith, it is because of a very direct creation of God. This is not him sort of letting the laws of nature have their other way. So, we have no idea if they exist. Right. Um, I think it would be awesome if they did, even though there would be some theological puzzles to work out if they do, but I don't think there would be any sort of theological roadblocks, puzzles, mysteries, but not roadblocks. Mm -hmm. So hopefully they are there. <laughs> just a quick question, if I could. Um, uh, just a quick question uh, from uh, a scientific perspective and of course you can't read the, the minds and the hearts or the conscience of any fellow scientists but when you look at the perspective of uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson who's uh, has said that he's agnostic and then going to the other extreme uh, a biologist like Richard Dawkins what do you think that they miss from a scientific perspective that you were able to or perhaps race was part of this as well um, where do you think that they could do better uh, from a scientific perspective? Yeah, I think you for that question. Yes, yeah, so you're of course talking about two very accomplished scientists. So mm -hmm. as scientists, in some sense, they are not really missing uh, anything. And I think that's an important thing. Uh, and I guess this is not really part of the question or assume, or assume is that my colleagues are excellent scientists. I don't think I'm a better scientist than them because I'm Catholic. I think I'm a better scientist than I would be if I wasn't Catholic, but that's like a different, a different way of comparing. Um, I think also that like, I did not become Christian because of my science. I became it for a very different, like was sort of got me started as a very different thing. It was on the one hand that I was completely sure that I have a free will. And as sure of that as of the law of gravity. And I think we live in a world where sort of only scientific truths are held up as true knowledge. But I would say any theory of the universe that cannot account for the fact that I choose is missing something. And I think we should be allowed to take that into account when forming a work view. Mm -hmm. The second thing that I knew for sure was that there are things that are truly morally evil. There are also things that are morally good, but these are easier to identify that things are truly morally evil. And if you admit that there's even one thing that is morally evil, even if every single person were to vote like the other way, you have put up some sort of external measuring rock. And that's now it becomes quite difficult to stay in this sort of purely materialistic atheistic work. And when you're talking about someone like who calls themselves agnostic, I think that is often what they recognize. There's something mysterious there that they're not really living as they are speaking most of the time. They live as if there are, they have free will, as if there are real moral absolutes. 
but they don't really have a theory to back it up. So that's where, in some sense, my so then the question I think quite is why do they stay agnostic? And a lot of people get very focused on what's in front of them. I think it often does take grace to, well, not often, it always takes grace to sort of lift you out of the things that are right in front of you, where it's the scientific problem, or the, you know, what you do with your family, or like whatever it is, to actually to lift your gaze and ask the question, why? Like, why does the universe exist? Like, you can be an excellent cosmologist and, you know, look at all the theories and work them out and understand the universe better and never ask that question. So it often does take something to shake someone up a little bit to start asking those kind of questions. So I think that explains why a lot of people are comfortable staying as an agnostic frame of mind. It is that, you know, it's working pretty well for them. And they don't really get that impediment. Like, their curiosity is fine. They your curiosity to a certain point. They don't really feel called to take them further. People like Dawkins are like pretty convinced atheists have obviously thought about it more. And then I think most of the time it's just really poor philosophical formation. Um, I mean, Dawkins is really witty. <laughs> and if you read some like God Delusion, it's like maddening how witty he is sometimes. I mean, he has a turn of phrase that can be very attractive. And it makes it like, I mean, in some sense, the argument there is you don't want to be one of those stupid people, right? I mean, that, that is the, the core of the argument. But if you look at these arguments against, for example, Aquinas, sort of proofs for God's existence, they're extremely superficial. So they're, and I don't think he's doing it on purpose. I think he thinks that he has understood the arguments, but there is this lack of philosophical formation that I think allows someone to, to say that even as they are thinking about it in graphic. Maybe time for a round of questions. My question is simply this. Have you read a testimonial to grace? I think you might like to wonder. <laughs> Did you answer that? Yeah. <laughs> With sign language, yes. Okay. But, no, I haven't, but I'll definitely check that. Thank you. Okay, so um, one more time, can you please give a round of applause for our wonderful? So um, on behalf of the St. Augustine Center for Ethics, Religion, and Culture, um, we could not be uh, more humbled or honored for your presence here um, this evening, Dr. Oberg. Um, we are all in your debt, and uh, we look forward to inviting you back at some point in the future um, to both our in-person and uh, live Zoom audience. Thank you for joining us. Uh, have a wonderful evening.